As we gather this morning to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, may we set aside our concerns and worries triggered by a disordered world and focus on him, our hope, our joy, our peace, our salvation. As we sing the carols, may we treasure their words of truth. As we listen to the readings, may our hearts and minds be taken back to that sacred day in history when God in Christ, for the sake of our salvation, was born to share our humanity. As God's word is preached and as our prayers are offered up, so may his hope, his joy and his peace fill our hearts. And let us remember before God all those who rejoice with us, that multitude upon another shore and in a greater light, whose hope was in the word made flesh, and who now stand joyfully in the everlasting presence of the risen and ascended Jesus Christ. Amen. The first reading is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9 beginning at verse 2. Isaiah foretells the birth of the Messiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The second reading is taken from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. The angel visits Mary. In the next six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. The third reading is taken from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. The birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place 
while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he was from the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, The time came for the child to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. The fourth reading is taken from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. The angel appears to the shepherds. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a, find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory, Glory to, to God, God in the highest heaven, and on, and on earth, earth peace, peace to those on whom his favour rests. Well done, Kit and Nico. He couldn't have done it without you. The fifth reading is taken from St Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. The shepherds visit the Christ child. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered on them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. We had my welcome. It's great to have you here and to see the church so full. I just wanted to make a particular thank you to Hilary and Lizzie for leading us in our carols today. And, uh, and Lizzie, it's lovely to have you here. And you may have spotted somebody else with hair quite similar to Lizzie's here today. And so a warm welcome to Lizzie's mum as well. It's lovely to have you here. Is this a, is this a genetic thing? or is it? A... <laughs> You're very welcome. It's lovely to see you. Uh, it's quite a, f- a, f- a first thing that's happened in my life, which I just want to share with you. Uh, last week I preached at the carol service in Astle. And there were eight people here this morning, I think eight or perhaps ten, who were there. And they said to me afterwards, Andrew, we think your message at the carol service Astor was so appropriate that we'd like you to preach it again at Swinbrook. Now, that has never happened to me before. <laughs> so I apologise to those ten, because you are going to hear the same message again. It reminds me a little bit of a, a lovely way in which um, the cricketer Chris Cowdery started a, an after-dinner speech at a very posh dinner at Lord's when he started off by saying in this black tie event, he said, I last gave this speech in Pentonville Prison, so I apologise for those who are hearing it for the second time. (laughs) It is slightly different as a sermon to usual, because what I want to do is just to take four texts from uh, the traditional carol service readings and then uh, briefly reflect on them and you t- need to need your own imaginations a little bit to, uh, to see the point that's going on. So it's not, it's not quite as plain and obvious, perhaps, as some sermons are meant to be. The first text, actually, was from a reading that we didn't have this evening. The, the, the carol service traditionally starts with a reading from Genesis chapter 3, where we read about the fall of man and, uh, and the promise that God makes that the... The, the heel would, would bruise the serpent's head, that, there'd be a, that, that the son of a, of a woman would bruise uh, evil, would damage evil, would crush the serpent's head. And uh, my first 
a text is uh, from that reading, and it's they hid, that is Adam and Eve, hid from the Lord among the trees. And it reminded me of a story of an incident that occurred in my life when I made a visit to the, a very poor country in Afri- Africa, Sierra Leone, one of the poorest countries in the world. And we were on a trip from our church there to visit a mission partner that worked amongst the, uh, the very marginalized people in Sierra Leone. And it was soon after the Civil War had finished in Sierra Leone and that I remember there being bullet holes on the buildings and all, all sorts of horrors. But one day when we had a day off, we went to, if you've ever been to Sierra Leone, you may know this, we went to what's called Beach Number no. 2. And Beach Number no. 2 was a, is a paradise beach. It's a beautiful sand, clear sea, wonderful swimming, safe, uh, a, a, a real paradise spot. Uh, 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 and uh, as we were playing games on the beach and enjoying ourselves, relaxing, swimming, playing um, some beach cricket, I think, and things like that, some fishermen came in onto the shore and they had just caught some lobsters and they built a fire and cooked the lobsters and were sharing them with us. It was wonderful, just a wonderful uh, situation. As we were eating the lobsters and uh, enjoying ourselves, out from the trees above the beach came a small boy, perhaps uh, aged eight or ten, something like that, in rags, and he came up to us begging and he only had one arm. His arm had been blown off by a, uh, a bomb during the Civil War, as happened in numerous children uh, in Sierra Leone, and of course is happening in our world today. It was as if hell had invaded paradise. It was as if a vivid reminder that something terrible has gone wrong with the beautiful world that God created. My second verse is from Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And I want to share with you uh, some words that were sent to me by a chap called Christopher Martin Jenkins. Christopher was a well-known cricket writer and commentator and was a good friend of mine. And he died 10 years ago from cancer. And during the year that he struggled with cancer, he wrote some poetry and some reflections. Uh, And I shared these with the congregation in Astle last week, the first time I shared them with anyone. And I want to share them with you now. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Christopher starts his poem called Nocturnal Laments. Cursed cancer, cursed cancer, cursed, cursed, cursed cancer, I hate and abhor you. Now, actually, Christopher didn't write cursed. I've sanitized that slightly. Uh, Christopher never, he was a non, he didn't swear, he didn't swear. Uh, But the adjective he used for this cancer did begin with F. And... uh, uh, it's quite funny because when you play golf with Christopher, he, if he played a bad shot, which happened quite regularly, as it does with me, he would go, fothering gay Thomas. Or, fothering And we all thought, oh no, what's he going to say? Fish cakes. He didn't swear, but he swore in this poem. But I decided to call, say cursed so as not to offend you too much. Cursed cancer, cursed, cursed, cursed cancer. I hate and abhor you. But I am a child, vainly screaming, behind a locked bedroom door. Silence crashes against my ears like the swift's airborne screechings. Faith battles against my fears and begs me heed the preachings. I am confused, awake when I should be sleeping. Often amused, but longing to be leaping, longing for a head that's still, a strong right arm again. To find a way there's a will, to find a way where there's a will, and an end to all this pain. A few days later, our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Why then, Lord, am I restless? A bit later, for now again the acid test, chemo, starting on Tuesday. Will my trust hold when the pain is biting, when it is dark and I am sore afraid? 
Please, Lord, give me the strength that I so badly lack and need. A few weeks later, morning joy. But now peace, Augustinian peace, knowledge that I am saved and safe, not yet a longing for heaven, for the failing body is fighting back and life is a boon, a many-faceted joy. Life has its hills and valleys, yes, but the hills are green and mauve and lovely. So praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice, no longer doubt him, glorious Prince of Peace. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Between the lumbering feet of the elephant, said Manly Hopkins, thou art there. And John Donne, repair me now like adamant. My Christ, my Christ, my Christ, my Christ, how much more before I come down from your cross. November the 1st, 2012. Predictions. Early this morning, I finally became a fully-fledged Christian. Since February, when our nightmare began, I have known deep down that in every sense I would be saved. Now the little voice of doubt has been silenced. I have been through hell, and Judy has too. I never want to think of this year again except for Lucy and Henry's wedding, Lucy's his daughter, on May the 12th, and the infinite kindness of people. The recent sh- scan showed incurable, advanced, aggressive lymphoma. It may yet be God's will to prove the deeply gloomy prognosis, in which case I shall face death in the certain knowledge of abundant joy in heaven. Certainly life will often be very painful. I still have regular chemotherapy to suffer for an unknown period, but my instinct tells me I shall live at least 20 more years and rejoice in the Lord always. December the 22nd, 2012. At the start of November, as you know, I opened Holman Hunt's door from the inside and asked the patient Jesus into my heart. Chris died day or two after he wrote that. Walking in the deep darkness of cancer, he saw a great light. It's interesting that Christopher uh, came with me some years before he got cancer to uh, speak at a cricket club in Seven Oaks, the Vine Cricket Club in Seven Oaks, to a men's meeting there. And I was the uh, evangelist, so to speak, delivering the Christian message, and he was there to support me and to talk about his own faith. And it was one of the most powerful evenings that I've been to because Christopher got up at this stage, before he had opened the door, as he put it, Holman Hunt's door, remember the picture of the light of the world is what he's referring to. It was some years before that. And he wrote and said, I'm a churchgoer. I believe in Christianity. I I want, that's where I want to identify myself but I don't think I've got there yet. I don't think it's happened for me quite. It's as if I'm missing out on something. But I'm determined to get there, he said. I'm determined to get there. And it was very helpful, because I think a lot of people could relate to that. It's how they felt, too. Is there a little bit more that I haven't yet got? So naturally, when some years later, just before he died, I received this through the email... At the start of November, as you know, I opened Holman Hunt's door from the inside and asked the patient Jesus into my heart. And he could write about rejoicing in the Lord always and hoping to live that he would rejoice in the Lord always. Clearly, clearly something had happened from the time when he was at Seven Oaks to when he was lying on his deathbed. My third text is from the Gospel of John that we'll hear in a few moments. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. See, this Jesus, about whom we have sung, is the only light that can truly dispel the darkness. Worthy people will try and do well. I'm sure there are many here. National and local politicians, educationalists, Medical people, economists, soldiers, food banks, environmentalists, all sorts of people. 
all sorts of people trying with all their might and sometimes with some success to turn the darkness into light. And all power to such people of goodwill. We should, of course, support them, and we do. But, but the wars rage on. The cancer still kills. The gunmen mow down innocents in schools. Random knife attacks uh, kill a mother outside a primary school, and that's just this week's tally. It could go on and on, of course. You all know that. The time has come for the light to shine. My next text. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. What or who can change a terrified man facing death too soon? Christopher was in his 60s, early 60s. What can change a terrified man facing death into someone confident of heaven? What can change that? Only Jesus. Only Jesus can change that. What or who can change the heart of a murderous Hamas terrorist plotting destruction in the tunnels of Gaza? Only Jesus can change a heart like that. Only Jesus can turn that darkness into light. What or who can rescue our world. The angel said to Mary, don't be afraid, you will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, which means rescuer. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David and he will reign forever and ever and his kingdom will never end. So you see this, this is the same Jesus who knocks at the door of our hearts. The cradle led to a cross, the cross led to an empty tomb, and the empty tomb means that the living Lord Jesus stands at the door and knocks. It is he who knocks. It is he who Christopher led in as he lay dying. And we can wait till the last minute to open the door, as Christopher did. We can, although you don't know when the when the last minute is going to be. I took the funeral on Tuesday of a friend, went to sit in his favourite chair, in the Forest of Dean. His partner came down in the morning, and he had gone. He had died peace, peacefully in his chair. Great way to go. Christopher had the opportunity, because the cancer gave him the opportunity, but you may not. So we can wait and risk it to open the door at the last minute or we can fling it open every day of our lives from now on. Live lives with the door open. Come in, Lord Jesus. No longer doubt him. He is the glorious Prince of Peace. Lord, we thank you that in your grace and mercy you revealed yourself Uh, to my friend Christopher as he lay dying and he was able to die in confident hope of heaven unafraid I pray for all of us here who have lingering doubts who are not sure give us the courage give us the strength give us the faith to open that door and welcome the Lord Jesus into our lives be born in us today Amen Oh.
Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. Father God, as we gather once more to celebrate the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who the prophet Isaiah tells us is wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. As we sing the carols and hear again the Christmas story, lift our hearts, we pray, and set our minds on this great mystery, that God was born as man, and for a while gave up his majesty and shared in our humanity. Help us to accept with wonder the mystery of a life conceived by the Spirit of God, born in a stable, raised in an ordinary home, trained in a carpenter's workshop, schooled in the Holy Scriptures. Help us to accept with wonder the mystery of a life empowered by the Spirit of God to reveal his salvation to a suffering, sinful world. Help us to accept with wonder the mystery of a life surrendered on the cross, yet raised to majesty and glory. Lord Jesus Christ, you are wonderful counsellor. May we know your counsel and wisdom in our lives, our joys, our struggles. Lord Jesus Christ, you are mighty God. May we find strength in you when we feel weak, powerless and afraid. Lord Jesus Christ, you are everlasting Father. May we know your deep love for us when we feel lonely or rejected. Lord Jesus Christ, you are Prince of Peace. May we know your comfort and peace in all circumstances. And so this Christmas, may our love of the Christmas story yield to a greater love a love for the one born that first Christmas, a love for the one who first loved us, a love for the one who gave his life for us, a love for the one who rose again, a love for the one who brings the gift of eternal life to all who trust in him, a love for the one who is Jesus, our Saviour and our God. And so as we look at our world, torn apart by war and disorder, by strife and lies and hate, we pray that your love will be so rooted in our own hearts that we may be bearers of your love to those around us, to the lonely, to the homeless, to the sick. And remember this morning our dear sister, Chris Haynes, who is in hospital to the sick, and to the troubled. We ask these things in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The final reading is taken from St. John's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Jesus is the word of the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that light was the life of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. 
the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. May the joy of the angels, the gladness of the shepherds, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest among you and be with you always. Amen.